Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for coming on time. Um, so welcome. Thank you for coming this evening. My name is Jonathan Lau. Um, we are going to cover uh, some stuff on the CFA. So hopefully uh, you're in the right room. Level <laughs> one uh, May CFA uh, for next year. Okay, that's the uh, that's the idea for this um, for this seminar. We've got a couple of people on Zoom, I believe, as well. Maybe a few people. And if you guys have questions, um, just feel free to type in the chat. Um, obviously, if you're here, just feel free to uh, shout or raise your hand. And um, I'm going to chat for about 40 minutes, okay, give or take, depending on how many questions there are. And then my colleague Yvette will, um, will carry on and do the last uh, 15 minutes or so. Okay, so, um, so as I said, my name is Jonathan Lau. I'm one of the Kaplan CFA trainers here. I take the English courses for level one and level two. Um, and I'm doing that for the last, uh, last few years. Um, let me try and... So that's a little bit about myself. Um, I am born and raised in the UK. Uh, first um, 12, 13 years of my um, career, I was in London in at Deutsche Bank in corporate finance and for a couple of uh, asset management companies. Then I moved to Hong Kong with my wife and um, I've been a trainer since then, so the last five years, um, in training uh, CFA candidates in level one, level two. I also do some banking courses for another company. Um, okay, so the agenda today is to run through uh, what CFA is, um, whether it's right for you, what, what, um, what are the career opportunities, and just a bit of an overview. Um, the main part is really going to be here. We're going to talk about what the CFA consists of, uh, the pass rates, and also if you um, if you seen the CFA or taken the exam. Has anyone taken the exams before CFA at all? No one's no actually tried these exams because they're changing a little bit. Okay, so there's a little bit of um, a little bit more uh, discussion, I suppose, for next year because a bit of a transition period. We're moving to computer-based exams. Okay, there'll be smaller halls, and um, but if you haven't uh, done the CFA, I might just allude to what they are like this year and and uh, how they're changing a little bit, just for your knowledge. Okay. Uh, then I'm going to do a quick demo lecture on one of the topics, um, alternative investments, um, and uh, and we'll talk about how Kaplan can can help you do the exam if you choose to do the exam. Okay, so the CFA program itself. Um, these are some of the big employers of CFA charter holders. So of course you're going to have some of the big banks um, and and uh, institutions some big pension funds, uh, accountants, these kinds of uh, big employers will, of course, hire a number of CFA charter holders. And we'll talk about how you get your CFA charter holder as well later on, not just past the exams, but also uh, what, else, what other steps you need. Um, what kinds of, p uh, of, of roles might require the CFA? I mean, this is just a broad uh, what is finance type of slide. Okay, so there's obviously... Uh, someone says they're in finance, it could mean a lot of different things. Um, sell side is, is basically the big banks and the different kinds of uh, offerings that they have and different divisions they have. But you have the buy side, which is like the fund managers. You have corporates with lots of different uh, treasury functions, and they may or may not have the CFA, of course. Um, and you have uh, uh, other, other areas within finance. And um, you, know, you, may, you guys may already be in these sectors. You may want to move across to some of these sectors, and perhaps the CFA can give you a grounding a bit of foundation about what, what finance is and, and, uh, and, and, and help you that way. Okay, in terms of uh, career opportunities, um, you know, what we're saying here and what we've looked at is just a number of, of job postings, as you'll see on the Internet, and uh, you know, often it will say things like... Um, CPA or CFA prefer that kind of thing. Okay, so often you'll have, um, you know, it would be a plus. So you know, it's not always. Usually, it's not necessary to have these qualifications. You know, it certainly has no guarantee of you securing a job at one of these banks. Um, but you know, it can help. Of course, if you're if you're matched up competing against someone with a similar background to yourself and they have the CFA charter holder and you don't, then okay, fine. They they might edge you out. And that's what we're saying. 
Okay, and a little bit about uh, the CFA candidates. They do some research every year, uh, the CFA Institute, and what kind of job functions CFA and candidates uh, end up in. And typically, as you might expect, you know, there's a, a fair proportion of them doing some kind of analytical work in sort of investment decision-making roles. Okay, and that's, that makes sense, but not always. You know, it's a pretty broad-based exam, so you'll get, some, you'll get people in risk managers, you'll get relationship managers, you'll get consultants, Accountants, you know, they they must love exams because they must have done the uh, the ACA as well. So, um, you know, the, these kinds of people, fine. Okay, so okay, main main part of today, really. Let's go through what the CFA is. Okay, so it is the big exam within finance. Okay, finance is broad, and this is a broad exam. Okay, there are lots of other exams as well. So you may have heard of a, f- a couple of other exams. Um, qualifications that Kaplan also provide courses for. FRM is one of them. That's risk management, so that's a very much a focus on risk. Um, there's Kaya, which is uh, a focus on alternative investments. Okay, these are also um, within the finance sphere and, and um, more sort of narrow, I would say. Okay, the CFA is a broader based, does a lot of different things. We'll cover the different topics that, that we cover in the CFA. Okay, but it is recognized as... Um, a good qualification to get, and, uh, and, and it's, it's difficult. Okay? So if you tell someone, or if you know people who are doing the CFA right now, um, people know what, what the effort it requires and the time it, put, uh, it, it requires for you guys to, to do it. Okay? It does require a substantial amount of time and commitment on, you, on your behalf in order to get the charter holder. Okay. Who can do it? Who can do this exam? They're, they're pretty relaxed about who can do the exam. Okay? So if you have a US bachelor's degree, then you can do the exam. And of course, that means if you've got a Hong Kong bachelor's degree, that's perfectly fine. Any, any sort of degree is fine. In fact, you don't even need to finish your degree. Okay? If you're in the final year, they say that's fine as well. Or if you don't have a degree at all, but you've been working full time for four years and not not in a bank, not investment related, just four years work experience, then you're also allowed to take the exam. Okay, so pretty much most people can take the exam. That's not too difficult. Okay, a um, little bit about how to become the charter holder. Okay, so there are three levels. Okay, so right now we're thinking about taking level one, and of course you need to pass level one before you do level two, and then you need to pass level two before you do level three. Okay. Um, so take them in sequence, okay, fine. What else? Uh, there's no limit in terms of the number of times you can sit the exam, okay? And uh, there's no, no time limit in terms of you can pass level one now, 10 years later, you can do, assu- assuming CFA is still around, and it probably is still around because, you know, it's been going for a fair while, okay? Um, then you can do level two and then do level three, okay, fine, no problem. Time limit's not an issue, completion time is not an issue. Okay, which means if you are persistent enough, you can definitely become a CFA charter holder. Okay, that's, that's the first thing. Okay, now once you pass all three levels, and we'll go into a bit more about the, the sequence later because that's a little bit more complicated. Once you pass all three levels, then what else do you need? You also need to have uh, four years of work experience, not just work experience. Keyword here is relevant. Okay, so it means um, investment related. Okay, so um, you have to have worked in a job that requires you to make, to make some sort of investment decision making, uh, in the investment decision making process. Okay, now it's four years cumulative. Okay, so you could uh, do a relevant job for two years, take a break, do something else, come back, do two more years, you've got your four years, and now you've got, you passed your exams, you've got your work experience, then you just need a couple of uh, sponsored statements and then you can apply and you should get your CFA charter holder. Okay, so there's no, and there's no um, time limit for the four years either. Okay, so you do need the relevant work experience as well as passing the exams. And then you get the charter holder. Is there any questions on this part? Yeah, go for it. Koske. Yeah. 
Mm, mm, mm. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. No, if you, so the question was, just to repeat for guys on the video, is if you work for a big bank, then I'm sure it's no, big, no problem to qualify for the relevant work experience. But if they work for a small VC or a small hedge fund, um, would that qualify? Absolutely, it would qualify. Okay. What they, when I did the application, all it's, it's, it's a line uh, or two that for you to fill out, okay? It's for you to describe your job and the, the roles that they are talking about. Are you, what kind of investment related uh, decision uh, making process is your job part of or, or you know, it's encompassed in your job and you just describe it. And then you need, uh, basically you need two people who have the CFA already to verify that and sign on your behalf. Okay, so it's, it's on them as well. So it's not just you making up whatever you do. They have to sign it and say, yes, I agree, Koske does this. Okay, and it's not, it's, not a, it's not necessary that just because they work for JP Morgan or Morgan Stanley, they will have this related function. Okay, if you are a, a, a admin staff, purely admin staff, secretary in, uh, in a, at a bank, you will not have that experience. Okay, so again, it does mean you have to have a, a related role. And you apply, and if they don't agree, then you, you apply again next time with better experience. Okay. Great. Um, now we've got three levels of exams. Okay. Now the first level is what we're really talking about here, and we'll talk about the main issue. The main issue is volume. Okay. And please do feel free to have a look at the uh, the, the text later. That's that's the volume we're talking about. Those big um, six books on the left hand side for me, and right hand side perhaps for you. Um, it's, there's a lot of material, okay? If you've never studied finance before, even if you have, um, that, is, that is the battle that we're facing with level one. Uh, level two is, is still quite a lot of volume, but, but I would say less than level one is in some ways, okay? But the material is slightly, slightly trickier, and level three uh, are similar, okay? But level one, that's, that's one of the issues we're really worried about in terms of just uh, uh, amounts, sheer volume, okay? Now, the weightings uh, for level one, level two, level three, well, really only care about level one for now. Okay, there are 10 different topic areas, and you can see the different weightings here. Okay, they've adjusted them slightly uh, since last year, but uh, you can see the ones that are, are relatively more important. Okay, FRA is a pretty big one in terms of, uh, of the weightings. Ethics is always important. FRA, by the way, is, is accounting. Um, and... Uh, well, you can see the big ones. Okay, so uh, you would try and spend more of your time on the larger weightings, of course, proportionately. Uh, that, that would be a good idea. Okay, so for example, derivatives, oh, only 5 to 8%. Maybe you, sp you spend, certainly spend less time on derivatives than you do on, on accounting. Okay, and that accounting would be far more important. And it's pretty hard to be good at all these different areas, okay? So we do absolutely need to study, okay? Even if you're in finance, you already have a job in finance, uh, it, the, the chances are you will have done an, a number of these, but not all of them, okay? Not all of them well, uh, enough to pass the exam at least. Okay, now taking the exam, okay? So they've moved to, taking, uh, to doing a computer-based exam from next year. Okay, which means they've increased the number of times you can do the exam, which is great. Okay, so last year and all the previous years, for, for, for many years, it's been two times, that you can take, two times a year that you can take the level one exam. Now, you can do it four times a year. Okay, so that sounds good, four times a year, as opposed to two times. But you cannot, you have to take a break of, of six months. Okay, that's, that's the, uh, the kicker. Okay, so let's say uh, you take the February exam and you fail it. You cannot take the May exam. You need to skip May and do August. Okay, you have to do a, uh, you have to have an interval of six months. Okay, so that's the trick. That's the one rule they have. Okay, now um, this is for next year's exams, and so we're really thinking about doing the May exam for this course. Okay, our course will start in January. Okay, so that's what we're thinking about here right now. Okay, if you're already signed up for the exam, has anyone signed up for the exam already? Anyone signed up? Have you signed up for which exam? May? May? Fantastic, good. Because um, if you did February, that's fine, but, but um, anyway. Um, what was I going to say? So these are the schedules for 2021. I'm going to show you 2022 as well. You can see they're slightly changed. Okay, level one's the same. Level three is the same. 
But level two, you can see there they've moved one. Okay, so this is, uh, this is like a transition year. And then from then on, level, the exams should be the same as this year, 2022. Okay, so 2021, uh, this one is a bit special. Let's put it that way. Okay, that's the, that's the plan. Yeah, another question. Go for it, please. No worries. Yeah. Sorry, if they've passed level one in February 2021. Okay, yeah. August, yes, yes, you're absolutely right. In fact, you've, you've preempted me. <laughs> We've got it, sorry, Koske. So yeah, good, good question, good question. Okay, so if, okay, I didn't, wasn't gonna talk about this because we're not, generally not doing this one exam, but it's fine. Level one, February 2021. If you'll pass that exam, you can do level two in the same year because we've got the six months. Okay, so you can do that. And then if you pass that, then you take the next level three exam, um, which is, well, the next one is technically November 2021, but that's three months. So you can't do the November, so you can't do November 2021, because it's only three months, so therefore you need to do the May 2022. Okay, so basically you just have to leave a six month gap. Okay, and then you're fine. Okay, but we're not really thinking about this one probably. So we're thinking about taking level one, May 2021. Now, if we pass, fantastic, we can do next level, uh, but we have to wait a year. Okay, we can't do, there's actually one in August 2021, but that's three months away, so we can't do that. Okay, so the next one we can do is level two in February 2022. And then if we pass that, we can do the next one in 2022 as well because there's a one in November and that's more than six months away and we can do level three in November 2022. Okay, so, uh, and then, you, can, and then you, you combine that with your four years work experience, maybe you already have that and you get your charter. Okay. Um, I mean, just to, just to be f clear though, you know, if you were to do this jump here, I think it's tough, and if, you, if it was another six month jump, it's tough, okay, because uh, you're not gonna get your results for like a month, I think, and so it's a lot of work, um, and it's not gonna be a pleasant year for you, I think, just generally. <laughs> it's gonna be very busy, very hectic, uh, but it's possible, okay, so if you, uh, if you want to do it, you can do it. A any questions on this part? It's a little bit tricky, but um, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, the exam format. Okay, so level one, multiple choice. Okay, great, so you've got A, B, C, you pick the right answer, no, no error, no penalties for a wrong answer, um, and you get um, 90 seconds per question. So you get uh, two, two exams during the day, four and a half hours in total, 90 questions in the morning, 90 questions in the afternoon. Okay, that's, that's, the, um, that's the format. Okay, this means 90 seconds a question it's very fast, okay? So some questions will be very quick, some questions might take you longer. You need to work quickly uh, and efficiently and, and, uh, and, and do them as obviously uh, without, mistake, without error and you know, circle the ones that you, know, you wanna come back to, but hopefully you have some time at the end to come back to them. Um, this has changed from, from this year, okay? So this year, December is the last time we'll do uh, three hours and three hours, okay? So it's actually better, shorter. Okay, I don't know if, if that shorter is better. I think shorter is better, but it means, uh, you know, if you, if you make some mistakes, they are more costly, right? So you can't really, so you can't recover as easily, perhaps. Okay, but you know, that's, shorter is probably better. Okay, now this is a big deal. Past papers are unavailable. Okay, so what you're gonna have to do and what I'm gonna really hammer home t today is that, that that's the best way of, of really um, preparing, okay? So making sure you do lots and lots of questions, okay? So uh, we'll, we'll come on to how that we can help you with that. Okay, so uh, the pass rates. Did, so does anyone know friends who have done the CFA before or studying for the CFA right now? Anyone know anyone? No? Okay, so 
Florence, do you know anyone who's, who's doing it or has done it? Okay. Okay, okay. They find it okay? Yeah, tough. I think tough is, is a fair <laughs> description. Okay, look, the pass rates, they're pretty low. I mean, forget level two and level three for now. Uh, level one's sort of, it used to be high 30s, actually. If you go back a little bit further, it was high 30s. Now it's low 40s, okay? So you have to beat 60% of the competition, and then you pass, basically, okay? And you get two numbers here because we used to do it twice a year, okay? But I guess next year we'll have four numbers, okay? So it's a really tricky exam. Now, uh, what is our target in terms of how much do we need to get right? 70%. Okay, you got uh, how many questions? Doesn't matter. Okay, so you used to get 120 questions, 120 questions. Now it's 90 and 90. But you need to get 70% correct and you will definitely pass. They have never failed anyone that scored less than 70%, no matter how easy the exam is. Okay, so that's good. So if it's an easy exam and you get 70%, you pass. Okay? So th what does that mean? That means if you get 68%, you probably pass. 66%, or oh, I don't know. You know, now we're like, we're not sure. Okay? So y but you hit 70, you pass. So that's, that's a great target. And that's, that's useful to know. So 30% means you can get 30% wrong. Okay? That's also very useful to know. Okay? All right. <coughs> Volume, as I mentioned before, volume is, is the biggest, biggest uh, hurdle. So uh, later on or afterwards, I'll, I will hand those, uh, those textbooks out. So, so Florence, you've already signed up for the exam, so it means you have those books on PDF. Unless you paid a little bit extra, then you get them in hard copy and you can flick through them. Okay, but they are, um, they're really hard to get through. Okay, they are textbooks. They throw in all the information in there, even stuff that they don't really test. And... Uh, it's, it's really hard to get through. I mean, the, it's thicker, smaller type fonts, thin pages, trust me, uh, 3,200 pages of, of um, not so easy to digest material. Still useful to go back to in terms of certain things, references, reference material, you, you want to go back, but it's not easy. Okay, so um, here's how we would suggest it. Okay, so here's our, 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 um, our approach. Okay, so the first thing would be the education phase. Okay, so the education phase is a, uh, basically a 10-week course, although the schedule that we, we have is uh, kind of split up a little bit. So basically it's 10 weeks, but I think we have some midweek classes if you have a look at the schedule. Okay, but it's basically uh, 10 lots of six hours. Okay, that's how I'll put it. Okay, and that's where we're going to run through the key learning outcome statements. You can see here we have 530 learning outcome statements, what you need to know to pass the exam. Okay, we'll go through a lot of the core material in our slide packs. Okay, and again, I'm going to show you those slide packs later. Or if you want to grab them, feel free. Um, there are four uh, slide packs next to, the, um, next, to the, next to the textbooks. Okay, so you'll get those, and then we run through them in class uh, and, and go through the, the core concepts. Okay, thereafter, uh, we do a four and a half week revision phase. Okay, where we've learned the key concepts and now we're doing lots of question drilling, making sure that we really understand the material, understand it quick enough, make sure we can uh, tackle harder questions. Okay? So here, some people will skip the education phase, self-study, and then come to the revision phase. That's fine, but make sure I mean, they really have to have studied, because if they haven't, then this is a complete nightmare. Okay? They basically they pick up nothing. This is not for cramming. Okay? Then what you want to do, if you want to, is do the mock Okay, so the mock will be your four and a half hour uh, session. So it will be just like the real thing, but you'll come here uh, and you will do a mock, and then uh, I will review that mock with you on uh, the following uh, week. Okay, that's that's that would be um, the whole um, schedule. Okay, so phase one, education phase. What we're saying here is volume is a real issue. Okay, as as I mentioned, so. Um, for example, if you go through learning outcome statement 51A to 51F, so six learning outcome statements, uh, they take up around about 30 pages in the, in the curriculum. Okay? Now, that can take you, I don't know, depending on how quick you read and understand, you know, a, a couple of hours, three hours probably at least to sort of run through. Okay? Now, in our slide packs, these learning outcome statements would be condensed to something like 16 slides, okay? Just 
um, as an illustration. Okay, now obviously, we're not gonna have all the information of those 30 pages, okay? We're really picking out the core concepts, trying to illustrate things, uh, try, trying to help you understand, okay? But, um, you know, we, we reckon this will probably take you a lot less, l less time to digest. Um, you still need to do questions and everything else, okay? It's not gonna, it's, that's not the end, but um, it's just a lot easier, okay, in, in our opinion. Okay, and then, as I mentioned before, one of the big things about, um, about how we can help you is by doing more questions. Okay, so during you'll have six online progress tests during the uh, the education phase. You'll have questions at the end of the each of those uh, those each of the chapters. There's ten topics. There's four books, but there's ten topics. At the end, there'll be uh, questions. Some of which we'll go through in class, but some of which you can just do by yourself. And then, of course, um, the Schweizer books. Again, the Schweizer books are important as well. Okay, the Schweizer books are those green books there on the right-hand side. Okay, so right there. Again, feel free to have a look. Because if you want, just, just go up and take them. Okay, um, when you s if and when you sign up to our course, you will get a copy of those books, uh, which are worth, I forget how much, a couple of thousand Hong Kong dollars, I think. Okay, and they, they will be useful, and they have, they have questions as well. Okay, and then you also have like pro bank, you have online questions that you can do as well. Okay, so lots of questions is really important. And in the, uh, the, the revision phase, we have even more questions. Okay, so the revision phase is those two books next to the four, book, four books. Okay, <laughs> so in the middle there, we've got the uh, revision phase, uh, big book of questions, and then the other one is the mind map book. And the mind map book is about our, uh, just a list of formulas. Okay, it's not really to work from. You need to have studied for it to make any sense. Uh, but that's the, that's the revision phase because we'll be doing lots and lots of, of questions. Okay, so, um, so that's the revision phase. That's a four and a half week phase. And then the, the final um, mock exam if you want to do the mock exam. Okay, so um, that's the, uh, the CFA materials I sort of covered. So are, are there any questions up to this point? I will hang around after for any questions, if you have any, of course. But up to that, anything, any questions on the CFA curriculum, the uh, course itself, or uh, timelines, or what it takes? Everyone's happy. OK, cool. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through a few slides on um, alternatives Okay, to finish up my part. OK, so. Um, one thing I'm going to point out, okay, so again, with our slide packs, this is an example for a slide pack, one of the slides, you'll have on the top left a uh, very uh, important reference. So if you, it'll say learning outcome statement 52A. So if you want to, you can then go back to uh, the books in the curriculum, or you can go back to Schweizer. As I said, these are, those are the notes that Kosuke just had a look at. Great. Okay, and you can go and review if you need more information. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so alternative investments. Okay, alternative investments is uh, going to be a 5 to 8% uh, weighting. And uh, so it's not one of the bigger ones, but I think it's quite interesting. Okay, so to, to go through very quickly. Okay, so it's 5 to 8%, and these, these are some of the sort of sample slides that we, we, we might use. Okay, so... Intro to alternative investments, have a look. Um, what are alternative investments, firstly? Okay, so you've got uh, traditional investments, and then you've got alternative investments. Okay, so traditional investments then would be your equities and stocks. They'd be your bonds, or we'll call them fixed income. Okay, these are, and, and cash. These are your traditional investments, okay? So if I'm going to invest my money, that's where I, I, I traditionally put my money, okay? Which means I have, I have some other options, okay? I have alternatives. So what are these? What are alternatives? Can anyone give me an example of what they mean by alternatives? Okay. Options and futures. It's a good shout. Um, very interesting. Um, well, it, it 
because they're derivatives, okay? Options and futures are derivatives, and we'll talk about them in a little bit, actually. Um, but with derivatives, what is a derivative? A derivative means this instrument, this investment, this investment, if you like, derives its value from something else, which means it derives its value from an underlying, often equities or fixed income. So, um, so if it's options and futures on equities and fixed income, you could argue that's still traditional investments, perhaps. Uh, but you, you're, not, you're not far, I mean, it's, it's possible, yeah. I mean, this, this can encompass a lot of different things, okay, alternatives, that's, that's a good shout. How about, you mentioned before, um, Koske, how about hedge funds? Yeah, how about hedge funds? Okay, what do hedge funds invest in? Lots of hedge funds in Hong Kong, right? Hong Kong's big financial sector. Um, they will invest in equities <laughs> and fixed income. So what makes hedge funds alternatives? Any idea? So the key is traditional investments, equities and fixed arm, we tend to think of this as long only. Okay, long only, meaning they, just, they go in and they buy equities with their cash or they don't buy and they just hold cash. Okay, that's, that's the way we think about these traditional investments. Whereas hedge funds, not long only, they can short. Okay, they have the flexibility to short. Okay, so that means, what does that mean? That means if markets are, you know, like this, and then everyone expects them to go down, what can a, a long-only fund do? If you're an equity fund, like a pension fund, for example, what can they do? Well, generally, they just increase their cash, reduce their equities, and, and, and pray, right? They, they move 50% of their Maybe if they can move 50% of their fund to cash, then they, 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 they save some money, and then when it comes up, they buy again. You know, great, that's, that's not bad. Okay, whereas what can a hedge fund do? A hedge fund can short, can go short, okay, using derivatives. You're, you're absolutely right. I think, deriv I think I'm a bit, being a bit unkind here. Yeah. I think derivatives probably does form some of the alternatives here. Okay, they can short, meaning... They can see this coming down, and they can go short the market. They can benefit. The market goes down. They actually go up. Okay? It's possible. Okay? So that's, um, that's, uh, that's one of the options for hedge funds. Okay, basically, alternative investments is anything that's not traditional investments. Okay, so hedge funds. Uh, what else? Private equity. What else? Commodities. So uh, go and invest in gold. Go to invest in oil, uh, art, collectibles, stamps, you name it, anything, okay? Anything apart from equities and fixed income and cash, basically, okay? So a lot of different things. So hedge funds, private equity, commodities, art, okay? These kinds of things. Okay, and so um, these, these so like hedge funds, let's go back to hedge funds or private equity, they tend to have higher fees. Have you guys heard of 2 and 20? 2 and 20? What's 2 and 20? Any idea? Zach, what's, what's 2 and 20? Uh, I thought you nodded. <laughs> Sorry. 2 and 20. 2 2% 2 annual management fee and 20% performance fee. Okay, this is uh, like a standard for hedge funds. I mean, it's coming down now because uh, people have gotten tired of paying these high fees. Okay, they're coming down, but they're still pretty high. Okay, so 2 and 20, they're generally higher fees, not always, but generally pretty higher fees. Uh, they tend to be less liquid investments, less regulated, less transparent, okay, these kinds of things. Now, okay, so why, if I'm a hedge fund, uh, sorry, if I'm a, if I'm a big wealthy investor, I, I put lots of my money in traditional investments, why would I look at alternative investments? What's the point? Why would I bother? Why would I bother with alternative investments, do you think? Diversify, diversify. What does diversify mean? Mm. 
reduce reduce risks yeah yeah brilliant brilliant um, you know you you can see the market going down well or, or you you know sometimes the market's going to go down. You don't want to put all your eggs in the, in the equity market or the fixed income market. Let's spread it around a little bit. You know, let's, put a little bit, let's buy some hedge funds. Let's buy some art. You know? uh, so that absolutely diversify. Okay? In other words, uh, you try and invest in uncorrelated assets. Okay? We talk about that more in, quant in which is, uh, quantitative methods, which is statistics, okay? which is another topic for level one, okay? which is another important topic. Okay, absolutely. All right, so, uh, okay, here it's actually all, all written. Okay, so alternatives comprise of things like hedge funds, private equity, oh, real estate, I forgot. Okay, I, I shouldn't have forgotten real estate because in Hong Kong, of course, everyone likes real estate, commodities, gold, oil, wheat, whatever, infrastructure, uh, a little bit, some other stuff, patents, collectibles, these kinds of things. Actually, the exam in level one really focuses on uh, hedge funds, and a bit of private equity. And then actually these three, private equity, real estate, and commodities, more in level two, I would say, more in level two okay, than level one. But still, uh, we're going to cover each of them, have a, have a slide on each of these in a second. Okay, so the benefits, as Koske said, big benefit is diversification, meaning don't have all your eggs in one basket. If the, if the market crashes 90%, don't have all your, all your investments there. We'll, we'll have some hedge funds that may be at a benefit. Brilliant. Um, also, how about higher returns? Well, that's good. If they can provide me higher returns, then brilliant. Even better. Um, not always the case, right? Because, well, you've got higher fees as well. Well, if they can provide those higher returns, you don't mind paying those higher fees. Uh, but it's no guarantee, right? They might just charge high fees and have lower returns or the same returns, and that's not that's obviously not going to be a, not not so attractive. Um, survivorship bias. When you're looking at buying a hedge fund, let's say you're looking at uh, a selection of hedge funds uh, in a in a, a magazine, you see like a table, or oh, which hedge fund do I want to invest in? You have to be aware that when you're selecting these funds they may be subject to survivorship bias. What's survivorship bias? The survivors have what? Have all the ideas. They have all the ideas. I mean, ideas are easy, right? You just read something, you get an idea. But, but you only have the choice of investing in survivors. You can't invest in the failed hedge funds because they're gone, right? So survivorship bias means when you're looking at these tables, okay, what is it, we're year 2020 now, so maybe, maybe we'll look at 2019 returns and we see, oh, A, B, and C hedge fund. And you know, maybe there's lots of them, right? They did this, they did this. And then you get an average and you say, oh, 21%. It's better than my 1% in the bank, right? But these are all survivors. They haven't gone bust. Okay, which ones have gone bust? The ones that didn't do 21%, the ones that did minus 30% or whatever. Yeah? These are, these are not in here anymore because they've gone bust. Okay, so when you look at these returns on the magazine or some index, they're always biased upwards. Okay, because you're only looking at the survivors. Okay, so that's... Uh, that's, that's, so you have to be aware that it's all um, tainted a little bit, right? Not just hedge funds, any, uh, any pension, f any, any fund really, any mutual fund, okay, will have that. Backfield bias is something quite similar, okay? All right, what is a hedge fund? As I said, hedge funds, they, are, they have all the tools in the toolbox, okay? They can use leverage. They can borrow, in other words. They can use derivatives, uh, futures, options. Um, they can short sell which means they can borrow and sell and benefit and then buy back when the price is low and they can benefit. Um, they're only, they're limited to qualified investors, okay? So you, this is not for your widows and orphans. You have to be a sophisticated investor in order to be able to park your money with these hedge funds. And you have problems with liquidity, okay? So, so even though um, 
you, so you, you, they give you, you give them the, your money, you can't take it out whenever you like. Okay? Usually, there's a lockup period. So they'll say, okay, thank you very much for your $1 million. Um, I'm going to keep it for one year before you can even ask me back, ask me for that money back. Even after that one year, there's a notice period usually, which means uh, you know, um, one month, give me, or three months, give me, month, give me some notice, I'll give it to you in three months' time. Okay, and that allows the hedge, and in in why do they do that? That allows hedge funds to invest for the long term, okay, and allows them to, to sell slowly out of certain investments, let's say. Because if you ask for it tomorrow, then maybe they have to sell 20% of something and the price will just get destroyed. Okay, that's one, that's one reason at least. Okay, so these are hedge funds and you know, they have all the tools in the toolbox. Okay, that's the key part here. They can do a lot of things that um, normal funds can't do. Okay, what else? Private equity. We've just got a quick slide here on what is private equity. So private equity, as most people think about it, is um, investing in the smaller companies. Okay, like venture capital is one of the strategies. Investing in your future Facebook or your future, you know, investing in Uber and then it goes public or investing in whichever company, but at a small stage. And then, you know, five years later, ten years later, the IPO and you make big bucks. Okay, that's venture capital and that is one of the strategies for private equity. The other strategy that's quite important actually is called leverage buyout, and that's using lots of debt, loading the company on with debt, and then uh, um, taking it over, and then selling it three to five years later is the is the is the uh, a very popular uh, strategy. Okay, and really more of a focus for level two, I would say. Okay, so that's private equity. What else? Real estate. Okay, so buying properties. So buying residential properties, buying commercial properties, shopping malls, offices, renting them out, uh, mortgages, mortgage-backed securities. Okay, one of the reasons why we had a big global financial crisis is a lot of investment in mortgage-backed securities. Uh, real estate investment trusts. These are funds. These are listed funds, listed property funds. So this is great because if you only have, uh, you know, 100,000 US dollars, well, that's not going to buy you any real estate in Hong Kong, much. Um, so maybe you want, and you want exposure to the property market, well, you can go and buy a fund, okay? But you, you can't live there, okay? You just own <laughs> some exposure to the property, okay? Uh, and farmland and timberland. Now, one of the good things about real estate, people believe, is that you are investing in something that is uh, protected to inflation, protected from inflation, I should say, okay? Why is that? Why is real estate relatively protected from inflation, do you think? Inflation being rising prices, prices going up, you know, 5% a year, 10% a year maybe. Why is real estate more protected than, than, than other investments versus, uh, to inflation, do you think? Any idea? Minimum requirements. Uh, it's important, isn't it? You need, you need to live somewhere, that's true. That's true. Okay, the reason why people think it's more inflation protected is because what you do with these properties when you buy them, you let them out, right? You let people live there, uh, build, a, have a shop there. They have tenants. They're giving you an income, right? And every year, you may be able to change that rental income. You may be able to say, "Oh, I don't. I want fifteen thousand. I want twenty thousand." So every year, you can adjust your rent. So if there's lots of inflation you can increase the rent, okay? That's uh, you know, not the environment we're in right now, okay? But in previous cycles, okay? Uh, that's, that's how you might better hedge yourself against inflation because you can, you can ask for more money because of inflation. Inflation is probably going to affect the whole economy, right? Okay, what else? Uh, last, last slide here then, commodities. So here we're talking about taking an exposure to oil or to gold, okay? Now, how am I going to gain that exposure through derivatives? Okay, so um, so you, as Koske said before, you know, options and futures, these kinds of things, right? Now, if the underlying is oil or gold, then these are uh, commodity futures and derivatives. Okay, and um, that's going to be the best way to get exposure to this. Why? Because if I like Oil, let's say, I really like oil, I think oil is going to go up in price, and I go out and buy 5,000 barrels of oil, then I need to go and find some place to put it. 
Okay, so that's the tricky part. Okay, I need to go and buy an oil tanker and put the oil there and, and you know, keep it. That's buying spot. Okay, that's tricky. But if I get it through a derivative, through a future, now I don't need to put it anywhere. I have no storage costs. Okay, so that's the good thing about commodities, uh, buying, getting exposure to commodities through derivatives, okay, versus then buying the physical product. I need to go and park it somewhere. That's really not so easy to do. Okay, what else? Uh, the return comes from uh, price changes, no income. Okay, that's important. Okay, you really need to get your, uh, your choice correct, otherwise you'll lose money. You don't get paid to, to, hold oil, to hold oil. In fact, you have to pay sometimes. You have to pay for storage. So that's not um, no income. That's a big deal. That's, that's, that makes it hard. Make, make, you, know, you have to be right, otherwise you lose money. And you, you hedge inflation risk with commodities. That's possible. Okay, that's possible depending on where the inflation is coming from. Okay, if the inflation is coming from oil price shocks, then, uh, yeah, sure, you own oil, then you'll be hedged, and then that's, that's great. Okay, quick quiz now. Ready? Question one. Which of the following best describes one of the potential benefits of alternative investments? Uh, reduction in portfolio risk, liquidity, or transparency? Which one of the following best describes one of the benefits of alternative investments? Reduction in portfolio risk, liquidity, or transparency? Who thinks A? Who thinks B? Who thinks C? Okay, good. A, reduction, why? Because of diversification, as, as Koske said, right? Liquidity, not really, because like I said, with your hedge funds, you don't even get your money back when you want to, right? You have to wait for, that, for those periods. We don't really talk about transparency, but hedge funds also like to be very, uh, they don't want to tell you uh, what's, what's in their books because they, they want to, uh, they, it's not free, free information is not, is not what they're up to. All right, question two. An investor is looking for a hedge against inflation, the investment most likely to achieve the investor's goals is A, farmland, B, hedge funds, C, private equity. Hedging against inflation risk, most likely to achieve investment goals is farmland, hedge funds, or private equity. Who thinks the answer is A? Who thinks the answer is B, hedge funds? Who thinks the answer is C, private equity? <laughs> if you don't know this then. <laughs> Okay, the answer, and the tricky answer, is farmland. Why? Because farmland is property. Okay, and as we mentioned before, you rent out your, your property and you should be able to increase your rent to farmers who are borrowing, who, who, are, who, are, who are your tenants. Okay, so that's the answer. All right, so um, any other questions that you can think of right now? Otherwise, I will hang back. Yeah, yeah, go for it, Koske. Two sponsor statements should be what? Uh, required. Uh, should be, to yeah. 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 I haven't seen the, uh, haven't done it for a while. I, I, usually it's like one from your uh, office, from, from your colleagues perhaps, and I don't, th I don't think it matters. I think you need to read. Re it might update it every year, so I don't know. So, but just two, I think. Yeah. But yeah, you need two. Yeah. All right. Good question.